The Joker is one of the most iconic villains of all time, and his allure extends far beyond comic book media consumers. There's a number of actual criminals who were directly inspired by the Joker, or at least use the character as a symbol. It's not surprising that a character who glorifies violence, and does it all with a smile, is lauded by people who share his interest in chaos. Today, we'll investigate the world of real-life criminals who saw the funny side. And keep in mind, this video will feature non-graphic descriptions of real crimes. I don't endorse any of these crimes, I don't glorify them, nor should they ever be recreated. This video is for educational and documentary purposes only. Thank you. When it comes to criminals who enjoy dressing up and cosplaying as Joker, there are few who hold as much esteem on the internet as Gypsy Crusader. Born Paul Nicholas Miller in August of 1988, his mother was a Hispanic woman named Diana Costello, and his father was a Romani, commonly known as a Gypsy, man named Robert Miller. While we know very little about what his father did for a living, we know his mother was an independent businesswoman who operated out of her house and worked as a psychic and tarot card reader for over 40 years. If the reviews she got on Yelp or anything to go by, she was a very nice woman and good at what she did, but only time would tell if the apple fell far from the tree. Despite being born in New York, he lived a significant portion of his life in New Jersey, in the cities of New Brunswick and North Brunswick, where each of his parents lived. While it doesn't seem like his early life is particularly eventful, as soon as Paul became 18 years old, he was charged with aggravated assault and possession of a weapon. While this may sound like a really bad start to his adult life, when examined in detail, it's revealed that the so-called weapon Paul was accused of possessing was a Remington Airmaster pellet gun, and the aggravated assault he committed was was firing it out of a window and hitting people. He pled not guilty and wasn't sentenced to any jail time due to the obviously light nature of the crime. However, in early 2007, he was charged with a much more serious crime, if not in the moral sense, the legal sense. In January, he was arrested and charged with dealing drugs. And not just that, but he was described as a confirmed gang member. Just two months later, he was arrested again, this time for slipping up and selling cocaine to an undercover police officer, who went on to claim that he was also in the business of selling weed, ecstasy, and heroin. Despite the typically extreme jail time for someone who gets this kind of crime, Paul got off relatively easy, with five years of probation, random urine testing for drugs, and the obligation to get his GED. Paul, now on probation, realized he had to turn his life around and go in a different direction because, were he to get caught again for a similar crime, he would be facing a life-destroying sentence. His next play, and a very wise one of that, was to become a martial artist. After a few months of reeling in from his close brushes with law enforcement, in 2008, when he was 20 years old, he began training in Muay Thai. Being somewhat of a natural at it, just three months later, he had his first amateur fight in the light heavyweight division, and he continued to fight for the next decade or so, racking up a record of seven wins and seven losses. While he had the misfortune of having his most documented fights be the ones he lost, he went on to become the regional light heavyweight champion and the U.S. national champion in the World Kickboxing Association. No small feat, if I may add. According to an interview he gave to Spotlight in 2020, he was actually planning to go pro until a car accident rendered him unable to endure training. But by this point, it didn't really matter. Paul developed a love for the sport and continued to participate in it as a coach and trainer for multiple gyms in New Jersey. Besides his work as a Muay Thai coach, Paul had many different interests and, consequently, often did odd jobs to add to his income. In the mid to late 2010s, one of the interests he developed, as many people did at that time, was politics. With political discussions completely overtaking every facet of media, Paul felt compelled to participate as well, and so he did. Following in the footsteps of so many pundits of that era, he began posting videos online of himself doing confrontational journalism. We are here, we are outside Instagram Studios. I'm gonna walk in. Do you guys want to talk about the, the what's it called, the banning of Republicans across the internet? I just want to know what's going on. I don't want any trouble. It was nothing innovative and didn't instantly net him anything approximating success. However, it was a sign of things to come. His decision to become an activist for conservative causes can be roughly dated to around 2018. And right around the same time, he was once again charged with illegal possession of a weapon. This time, a real weapon. And given he was a convicted felon from his drug charges 10 years prior, this posed much more of a threat to his life. Liberty. However, for whatever reason, nothing came of it, and the rest of 2018 went by smoothly. But something happened in October. On the 12th, Paul was attending an event at the Metropolitan Republican Club, namely a speech from Gavin McInnes, the founder of the Proud Boys. Paul said he went to cover the show and hang out with some friends of his, not knowing how the night would end. For starters, he failed to even make it inside due to the event being sold out, but this gave him an opportunity to do something else. Noticing that there were about two dozen Antifa shaking the barricades outside the venue and screaming political slogans, he thought it would be a good idea idea to capture it on video. So he began live streaming. It's not a huge gathering of Antifa on the other side, but uh, they are there. I don't know if things are going to get violent. There's a heavy police presence, so we should be fine. 
God willing. While he contemplated instigating their rage to see what would come of it, he settled for only recording what was going on. But even that was more than enough for him to attract the ire of the Antifa members present. As they noticed Paul's presence, and since he wasn't exactly sympathetic to their cause, one of their leaders, as Paul put it, approached him and said, Watch your mouth or I'll knock you out. What do you want? As he turned his phone to record the man saying that, he had his phone knocked out of his hand. Unbeknownst to the Antifa member, Paul was a trained martial artist who proceeded to elbow him in the face with such speed that the officers present didn't even see it. Because of this, the cops settled for just breaking it up and letting each party go their own way. However, Antifa weren't satisfied. As Paul and his friend, a Jewish girl, which he makes a point to note, left the event, they noticed they were being tailed by multiple Antifa members. Paul gives his phone to his friend and tells her to run away as five people jump him and try to grab her. Yet another fight breaks out, but this time, two proud boys take Paul's side, and the conflict ends rather quickly. His friend eventually comes back with the cops, resulting in three of the Antifa members being arrested, but not before they successfully stole Paul's backpack. After being tackled and handcuffed by the police, the Antifa members continued to call him a Nazi and try to fight the police officers. Given the situation, Paul was already very prone to disliking Antifa, but his dislike turned into sheer unbridled hatred when he found out that, despite giving the district attorney footage of the event and statements from four witnesses, the three men who attacked him and his friend were ultimately let go. Two of them were resolved in a non-custodial pretrial diversion program, while the DA dropped the charges on the third one. At least from Miller's perspective, this was egregious injustice, especially when compared to how punitive law enforcement was to the Proud Boys who were arrested that night. Much like the Joker put it, Paul had one bad day, or night to be specific, and it changed him forever. You could say it was at this moment that Paul Miller became Gypsy Crusader. A few days later, Paul is interviewed by one American news network where he retells his story. Over the course of the following months and the better part of 2019, Paul begins being constantly doxxed by left-wing activists online, along with regularly receiving death threats to him and his family and copies of the Quran in his mail. He was working at a gas station at the time and his boss began receiving calls saying he was employing a racist and the pressure got to the point that after an altercation between a Muslim client and Paul, he lost his job. In 2020, Paul made an Instagram video attacking people who were against the First Amendment but still used it to defend the BLM protests that were happening at the time in the wake of the George Floyd incident. In response to this, his address was once again leaked, this time to the local chapter of Black Lives Matter, who promptly mobbed his elderly mother, showing up at their front door and making incessant phone calls demanding her to say Black Lives Matter, which she refused to comply with. Now, this obviously isn't a defense of Gypsy Crusader's antics later on by any means, especially since he was already engaging in the more offensive aspects of his charade by 2019. For example, he already had his Instagram handle, 8 being a reference to the 8th letter in the alphabet, H, with H H being him hailing the leader of a certain controversial German political state from the 1930s. He even briefly considered running for Congress, as is verifiable in an episode of a podcast he did in the middle of 2019. While he was already more than comfortable with his radical ideology and its symbols, it was only in 2020 that it reached a fever pitch when his coach of seven years called him up and said that he was no longer welcome at the gym due to his radical politics. While Paul said he understood that his coach was being harassed and that's why he made the decision, this still meant that his main source of income, being personal training had officially been shut down for good. Despondent, infuriated, and on the brink, Paul decided to double down. During 2020, inspired by another radical named Philip Headley, he began doing trolling on Omegle. Before, Gypsy Crusader was just an idea, but now it was given life. What's wrong, kid? I just got bullied for being gay. <laughs> oh yeah? What's well, about to happen again? <laughs> What's your relationship like with your father? Uh, I don't have one. <laughs> Since he'd been relegated to being a hateful person, he decided to relish in it as much as possible and say the most offensive things he could imagine. And somehow, it worked to his benefit. Despite being constantly banned from every single social media platform he tried to get on, he consistently managed to maintain a following. His Telegram, one of the few places he managed to stay on consistently, accrued over 40,000 people, which is pretty impressive for Telegram standards. Whether it be as Joker, Riddler, or Mario, Gypsy's content wasn't exclusively consumed by a niche of radicals. Much to the contrary, he was well on his way to becoming popular with casual YouTube consumers. Countless clips of him went viral on TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, you name it. He was a bona fide celebrity for a second. And as much as I wish I could show you a lot of his clips, um, well, there's a reason why he got banned from YouTube all the time. As you can imagine, this once again attracted a lot of negative attention. In the middle of 2020, he was organizing anti-lockdown protests, and after a few of them had gone nowhere, he suggested that maybe they should be organizing armed protests, as that would get more eyes on it. He was promptly visited by the FBI. However, However, for the moment, he was deemed not a threat and no action was taken. At the time, he was actually living with his parents and officially unemployed, but with his newfound fan base, he saw an opportunity to make some money and began selling patches. And once
once again, to the surprise of many, they sold really well, making Gypsy some money. Despite seemingly finding respite from his many woes, it was clear that Paul was still having internal struggles, saying things like, I'm old. I'm getting old. I'm 32 years old. I don't have children. I don't have a girlfriend. If they kill me, what's lost? Nothing. Nothing is lost. The only thing that it will do is accelerate what must happen. That's it. My life was worth something. According to him, he was now living in Florida, and in early 2021, he started being harassed again, but this time not by left-wing activists, but by fellow radicals. An unknown Canadian man who claimed to be a member of a splinter group of the Atomwaffen Division began threateningly pointing out every location that appeared in the background of Gypsy's videos. Next, he started posting his own videos in those same recognizable locations to prove that he was truly in Paul's vicinity. Then, he actively stalks Paul outside of a Waffle House, followed by incessant calls made to the local police force claiming a robber was breaking into his house, as well as mountains of pizza being ordered and delivered to an old landlord of Paul's. There were also DDoS attacks being made to prevent him from streaming. The objective of this was to get Paul to stop streaming because these radicals felt it was a travesty to have someone of gypsy heritage represent them. As insane as that, as insane as that may sound, okay? Guys, the racists are fighting. <laughs> After Paul left his complex for a while to let the situation die down, it eventually did, and he resumed his streaming. However, this piece would be extremely temporary and fickle, as just two months later, he got arrested once again. At around five in the morning, his home in Fort Lauderdale, Florida was raided by the police, and Paul was charged with possession of an unregistered short barrel rifle and over 400 rounds of high-powered rifle ammunition. Though he hired a pretty good attorney, he eventually pled guilty to all three charges, as he talks about in a video recording of him during a phone call in prison. So let me give you the rundown real fast. Uh, I'm going to take the plea agreement that they're giving us, giving me on uh, Tuesday. If everything goes well, I'll serve around 18 months. If everything goes okay. He was sentenced to a whopping 41 months in prison and another three years of supervised release. That's obviously a significant amount of time, but considering he was initially facing up to 30 years, it's a pretty good deal. At the beginning of 2023, he was released on good behavior and into his supervised release, but shortly after resuming his online activity and selling the Joker patches once again, his supervisors were informed and he was once again imprisoned. A few months later in July, he was released again and has been free since. In the interim of all his issues, his fiance left him and his mother, whom he credited as his biggest supporter for his entire life, sadly passed away. She was the best mom a son could ever have. She bought me everything. She took care of me. She came to my fights. She bandaged my cuts. She paid for my training. She cheered me on. Despite now being free, it's hard to say if he'll be capable of enjoying that freedom to any extent. Christopher Clancy was a 17-year-old boy who went to Kalaishta Killian, a secondary school in the town of Klondalkin in Dublin, Ireland, where he was from. According to his peers, Christopher was introspective and reserved, showing no signs of violent or otherwise delinquent tendencies. He lived in Cherrywood Grove, while the school was in Old Nanger Road, meaning he lived extremely close to it, just a couple of minutes away. I believe the saying goes, familiarity breeds contempt, and unbeknownst to anyone around him, contempt was something he had in bundles, and eventually, it was bound to hit a boiling point. In November, 2008, his time in school came to an end, and like many of his other pupils, he had plans and aspirations. Particularly, he wanted to attend the Dunleary College of Art and Design. However, over the years he spent in that school, he developed negative feelings for it that wouldn't simply go away once he'd left. For reasons unspecified, he felt that the school was run by hypocrites and didn't like the way they treated his friends. Though light was never shed on what exactly he meant with those words, the school did have a pernicious history of less than honorable dealings coming from its staff, with a teacher defrauding roughly 11,000 Irish pounds collected for a school trip and using it to buy alcohol in 2001, when Christopher would have been nine years old himself. Man, I guess that's, uh, that Irish stereotype exists for a reason. <laughs> Whether this affected Christopher's perception of the school or not is unknown, but what is certain is that, almost as soon as he was no longer one of the school students, he began hatching a plan to wreak havoc and revenge for what he perceived was the school undermining its pupils. Over the course of five weeks, Christopher slowly but surely purchased six large jerry cans from Atlantic Home Care and hid them near the school grounds. Then, he bought 100 liters of gasoline from a gas station nearby and filled the cans. All in all, it took him a couple hundred dollars and about half a year to set up, but his resentment for the school was so great that he was willing to undergo these hurdles for his Gus Fring tier plan. Finally, the time came to put it into action. On the fateful Sunday afternoon of May 10th, 2009, he dressed up as Heath Ledger's Joker, purple suit and all, and went to the school grounds with bolt cutters. After cutting through the chain link fence and making his way to the school itself, he smashed one of the windows, brought the cans with him inside, and began 
spilling them all over the corridors. Having finally exhausted the contents of the jerry cans, he set it on fire, and as you can expect, the entire place immediately went up into flames. Though he did run out of the building, he didn't actually flee the scene. Instead, he was recording it on his phone and planning to send it to his friends. He stuck around long enough for the fire department and the police to show up, only to see him in Joker costume, holding the bolt cutters, telling them to go around the corner and take a look at his work. As far as role-playing the Joker, he was definitely on point with that one. As he was being arrested, he began threatening to shoot the officers, but it was clear he had no viable way of doing that and was just blowing smoke. While he had never come to the attention of the police before, nor had a criminal record, it was discovered that he had been suspended a number of times and was considered a notorious troublemaker who held a grudge against the school management. Though others have claimed this is an exaggeration, and Christopher had never hurt anyone who didn't hurt him first. Despite his crime being deliberately committed when no one would be at school and thus wouldn't hurt anyone, Chris was still facing very serious criminal charges for arson. Ultimately, he did around 1 million euros worth of damage. Luckily, the fire was contained to the back of the school and didn't spread all over it, but still, the parts that did damage were destroyed beyond use. The school was shut down for five days, and the police claimed that it would take at least four months for classes to resume completely. As for Christopher, when asked by the policeman about his crime, he said, I'm glad I did it, because the people will realize they can't treat students as subhuman. His evident lack of regret over what he'd done didn't bode well in court, but the judge gave him the benefit of the doubt and postponed the sentencing to October so that he could get medical help in the meantime, claiming that what he had done was a one-off incident, and that Christopher hadn't addressed the depressive episode that came in tandem with the arson. Surprisingly, when it came to receiving a sentence, Christopher was given 240 hours of community service instead of two years in jail, which is a pretty big leap in my estimation. While not exactly scot-free, it could have been way worse. We often wonder what can happen to kids these days. Being exposed to all kinds of unsavory or even downright gruesome content online from a young age. As a matter of fact, we often joke about it, but the reality is, for some kids, it can desensitize them to things they really shouldn't be desensitized to. Such as the case of a young girl who's gone unnamed by court documents and journalistic articles due to her age, but that, for the purposes of this video, we'll be calling Lucy. Lucy was a 14-year-old girl from Hampshire, England, and she had issues, to put it mildly. Most of what we know about what Lucy was up to comes from a friend of hers whom we'll call Amy. According to Amy's recollection in the media, Lucy had an extensive history of being fixated on dark and disturbing topics. For example, she had based one of her GCSE projects on serial killers Ted Bundy and Richard Night Stalker Ramirez because, as she puts it, she thought it was cool and edgy. Other subjects of Lucy's interest were people like Anders Brevik, a Norwegian domestic terrorist who killed 77 people and injured well over 300 in one of his attacks. If that wasn't enough of a red flag, Lucy also had the habits of ritualistically exposing herself to all kinds of not-safe-for-life content online. From random videos of people dying, to Islamic State execution videos, all the way to extreme torture and CSA. The worst of the worst. She watched it all. Notwithstanding, she also made it a point to show the videos she downloaded on her phone to her friends at school, one of which was Amy, who according to her at least, played along with it to humor her friend, perhaps to a fault. She was also, as most, if not all, edgy teenagers are, deeply interested in Columbine, to the point where she'd told Amy she had a hit list with 60 people on it, including her own mother and brother, in addition to a multitude of fellow students. She even started a journal in which she planned for a massacre she intended to carry out in November 2016. However, she eventually gave up the idea for reasons unknown, burning the journal, and opting instead to focus on potentially getting her own family. One of the more grim aspects of this was the levity with which she approached these topics to her friend, saying things like, it's either getting rid of my mother and brother or a school massacre, but I want to do it after I get off my braces and before the science GCSEs. Because of the joking manner in which these very concerning ideas were brought up, her friend tended to blow them off, assuming it was nothing to take seriously. And you honestly can't blame her that much because it seems everyone knew at least one person that became obsessed with things like Columbine in their teen years. Quite unfortunately, she was wrong in her assumption. As the month of April approached, Lucy's attention once again shifted, this time away from her family and toward a former close friend of hers, whom we'll call Claire. In the recent past, Lucy had struggled with fake accounts impersonating her on Tumblr and Instagram, and for some reason, she believed believed Claire to be behind all of this. Because of this, she began seriously considering taking her life, going as far as researching the fatality rate of stab wounds and the exact position of a heart so that she could target it. In her conversations with Amy, Lucy expressed an interest in giving herself Joker scars. Again, it wasn't taken to heart at the time, but this fixation in particular was one that would soon come to fruition. After talking to Amy about how the scars would persuade a judge to accept an insanity plea, Lucy discussed going on the run with her to evade arrest, burning their passports together, and even taking 
taking the life of an old woman so that they would have a place to stay and drink tea, though Lucy said they were going to be smelling quite bad after a few days. From the tone of the conversation, it's easy to imagine how it wasn't taken seriously. However, eventually, Amy received a picture on Snapchat of Lucy with both sides of her mouth cut, a sign that there was a backdrop of serious intent to Lucy's words. Other of her messages to Amy include her saying that she wasn't inspired, but motivated by the Joker and Columbine, and that if her plan were to fail, she would simply claim the voices in her head made her do it. When asked about why she played it cool throughout all of these bad omens, Amy said, I was keeping her happy. It would have been uncool to do anything else. The day after, on the 25th of April, Lucy showed up with a black scarf covering the lower half of her face to conceal the light scarring, though she did go out of her way to show them to Amy in person. If she hadn't blatantly incriminated herself enough yet, she reminded Amy that she was, indeed, going to try to take Claire's life that day, and once again, it was brushed off. From Amy's perspective, the two were frenemies who got along well and together, but always had something bad to say about each other when they were separated, which she chalked up to the natural friction between their personalities. It wasn't until Amy was in class that she began contemplating the possibility that, just maybe, Lucy wasn't kidding, at which point she started panicking and asked to go to the bathroom so that she could go looking for them. While describing this moment, she said, I wasn't particularly thinking straight. Instead of going to the toilet, I went behind the science block where I was slightly reassured there wasn't anybody. Her instinct was to call them, but to no avail. It was too late, and Amy only found out what had gone down from other students who had caught wind of it before. Unbeknownst to everybody, the night prior, Lucy had messaged Claire, saying she intended to give her something, closing the message off with a kiss emoji. When they met the next day, Lucy lured her to a secluded area while continuously giggling. Finally, when they were alone, and Lucy claimed she had a present to give her, asking Claire to close her eyes and put her hands out, as Claire complied, Lucy moved her hair to the side, prompting Claire to briefly squint her eyes open to see what was going on, only to see her friend lunging with a knife. Thanks to her timely suspicion, she managed to take a step back and start running away, which turned a potentially fatal stab wound into a minor puncture in her chest. Perhaps finally coming to appreciate the gravity of her deeds, Lucy also decided to run away. But somewhere along the line, she came into contact with her parents, who brought her back to school to be questioned. At this point, everyone had already heard of what she'd tried to do, and she was promptly arrested. The trial lasted about half a year, with Lucy immediately pleading guilty to having a bladed weapon on school premises and unlawful wounding. But she didn't plead guilty to attempted murder and wounding with intent, claiming that Claire was never her objective. Of course, this defense fell apart as the investigators went through her search history and discovered she was researching how to deliver a death blow. Additionally, she claimed her plans to have a massacre at her school were never serious, and that she didn't even understand her own motives for the stabbing, saying, I didn't feel very much in control of what I was doing. I didn't want to. I felt I had to. I felt that within myself, I had a driving force to hurt someone. I was scared of losing face. I intended to stab her. While the judge did humor the insanity plea, the same one she was joking to Amy she would make, after the pre-sentence psychiatric report was completed, she was ruled guilty of attempted murder and sentenced to 10 years in jail with an extra four in probation. The reasoning behind this was the extensive premeditation, the kind of content she was voluntarily seeking out and exposing herself and her friends to, and most importantly, the determined lack of emotion, which she displayed even as she was being sentenced to 10 years, though some speculated she may have been holding back. Additionally, a restraining order was taken out that permanently made it legal for Lucy to come close to Claire, who was now diagnosed with PTSD and struggled to even close her eyes. Despite all this, Claire was still cited as occasionally missing her friend and not really understanding why she did what she did. By all accounts, Joshua Van Buskirk was a normal man, perhaps even too well-adjusted for his own good. While almost nothing's known about his early life, we do know he went to two different high schools, Clayton Valley and De La Salle, both in California and relatively high class. It was in these two schools that he met his closest friends, some while playing youth soccer, others while playing softball, but regardless, they were people he had a mind to keep around for the rest of his life. However, his plans were slowly foiled upon graduation as all of his friends got blue-collar jobs while he began a career in finance, working for Wells Fargo. According to him, this made them very jealous. Though it's likely if his friends were the ones telling the story, they'd say that Joshua developed an ego problem as a result of his position. Fortunately, even with these ill feelings brewing in the background, they managed to maintain their friendships. In 2011, Josh had plans to marry his wife at the Brentwood Golf Club on October 1st. But before that took place, his friends threw him a bachelor party in Reno and proceeded to be his groomsmen during the wedding, which signaled that, despite the uneasiness, they were still happy for their friend. For the next four years, Josh experienced what most people wish for. He was married, had a high-paying job, and had a healthy social circle. But in 2015, things took a turn for the worse, one that Josh was not at all prepared to handle. It's unknown why specifically it happened, but in May of 2015, he was fired from his job at Wells Fargo. Almost instantaneously, his demeanor shifted to a negative, even toxic one, as he couldn't contain his bitterness and resentment over the loss of his position. After all, his job had, at least in part, become his identity, and to lose it meant he had nothing to differentiate himself from his friends, or anyone else. The person who underwent the 
worst consequence of these changes was his wife, who witnessed the man she married become a shell of his former self. Just three months later, the couple separated. Again, we don't know the specific reasons why, but it's not hard to tell that the sheer frustration Josh was carrying with him must have worn their relationship too thin to stand. In the same month, and probably because of the separation, Joshua was driven to the John Muir Medical Center in Walnut Creek by his father and was promptly put on a 72-hour mental hold. He since claimed this was a voluntary self-check-in, but it was clear that he was suffering from some kind of intense mental anguish at the time. At the medical center, he was diagnosed as paranoid and delusional, and as a result, he was prescribed anti-anxiety and antidepressant psychiatric meds. You might expect that after getting treatment and being put on meds, Josh's behavior would improve, but you'd be wrong. Just a month later, on September 15th, his wife filed a restraining order against him, alleging erratic behavior, including threatening text messages. Not only did he lose his job, he had clearly and permanently lost another pillar of his identity, his relationship with his wife. That same month, he also decided to quit the softball team he was a part of with his friends because he felt slighted when they made jokes at his expense. This meant that, for the first time in a very long time, Josh had absolutely nobody to rely on, no one to talk to or confide in. He was completely isolated. On October 9th, he filed for divorce, which seems to be par for the course considering he and his wife were already separated and estranged. It would have been enough of a tragedy for the story to end here, but under the surface, Josh had cracked, and feeling like he had nothing left to lose, he decided he wanted to strike back at the people whom he felt betrayed him and left him at his lowest point. Three days after the divorce was filed, one of his groom's men's Ford Ranger, which was parked at the field they played softball on, mysteriously went up in flames. When the scene was investigated for traces that would indicate whether this was a case of malicious arson or some freak accident, the police found a Joker card was left behind, the same way that the Joker in The Dark Knight left cards behind when he committed a crime. While Joshua was immediately suspected, considering his circumstances, no one really presumed he'd be capable of such a thing. For a while, the crime went unsolved. The month of November went by quietly and uneventfully, and so did the majority of December. It wasn't until the 23rd day of the month that another of his groomsmen's trucks also got torched, and once again, a Joker card was left behind, this time along with a bottle of lubricant of all things. Perhaps, sensing that, even if he were to try and lay low and wait it out again, he would be arrested no matter what, Josh decided to do as much damage as he could in the shortest amount of time possible. In the days immediately following this attack, he proceeded to creep up to another groomsman's home and torch his garage door. It's unknown if he knew this or not, but inside the house was not only its owner, but his entire family, including his two kids, adding another degree of darkness to his crime. This time, the trophy Joshua left behind was a bottle of J&B being his initials. He was still not done and moved on to yet another attack, this time on the 3600th block of Walnut Avenue in Concord. It was at this crime scene that they figured out Joshua's method of attack. Glass bottles of Bacardi and dark horse wine filled with gasoline, with red and gold towels zip tied to the inside, in the form of a wick. The fact that even his Molotov cocktails were composed with intent, and almost had a signature to them, was part of what led the police to him directly. As he left the scene, he left a dog collar hanging on the front gate, along with an ace of spades and a joker card, with a note. The note had multiple dots on it with the phrase connect the dots beneath them. Besides this, he also left an empty prescription bottle, but instead of pills, it contained some kind of powder and an empty casing for a 9mm weapon. The victim of this attack thought to speak with the other men who attended Josh's wedding, and only then they communicated amongst themselves about the identical attacks they'd been under. One of them shared that they'd received a multitude of texts from Josh, blaming them for not being there for him when he was in need, and cryptically saying he was busy putting out fires and suggesting they would all die. If it had hadn't been on the nose until this point. After this discussion, it was all but confirmed. Regardless of how crystal clear this case was, it was only a few weeks after his last crime that the police got involved. Quickly, the items he left behind were traced back to him and his condo, with the San Francisco 49er towels he used for wicks being found cut up, along with the decks of playing cards he took the jokers out of, the zip ties, a gas can, a package for a lighter, and last but not least, a shirt and a pair of gloves that smelled like gas. As it turned out, the towel was a gift to Josh from his wife, and the collar he hung up from the gate belonged to their pit bulls. Even the bottles of alcohol used during the attacks were selected to match each specific groomsman's favorite beverage. After he was arrested, he was charged with three counts of arson, three counts of possession of Molotov cocktails, one count of arson of an inhabited property, and two counts of child abuse due to the kids inside the house he tried to burn down. His bail was set at a little over $2 million, and to all these charges, he pled not guilty. The specifics of how his court case turned out aren't available online, but the next time the name Joshua Van Buskirk appears in the news, he's cited as being incarcerated at Snake River Correctional Institution in Oregon.
From an outside perspective, Army Specialist Christopher N. Lanham was a regular person. A beloved son and a father of one, Christopher was native to Portsmouth, Virginia. After graduating from Kellum High School in Virginia Beach, he pursued a career in the U.S. Army. He succeeded in this pursuit, eventually being deployed for combat duty in Iraq for a total of 18 months over the five years he was in. It's unknown what exactly he experienced during deployment, but it's safe to say it probably contributed greatly to his deteriorating mental state. Upon his return from Iraq in September of 07, he was then assigned to a medical unit in Fort Eustis. Whatever psychological issues he may or may not have developed during his time in Iraq, they remained dormant until July of 08. That is, until they were awakened and called forth by the release of the Dark Knight movie, which served as a catalyst for the following events of Christopher's life. Immediately, Lanham became deeply fixated with the film, being particularly obsessed with Heath Ledger's Joker, identifying with him. His issues were kicked into high gear by this obsession, and over the course of the next almost eight months, his mental well-being was being gradually eroded until he hit a boiling point in March of 2009. Within this period, his girlfriend, Patsy Ann Marie Montowski, observed Christopher transforming into something unrecognizable. He began decorating his living quarters with Joker-themed paraphernalia, including paintings, images, masks, and even face paint on his furniture. Despite being back at home and no longer in Iraq, he developed the habit of doing something he called preparing for war, which meant ritualistically cleaning and sharpening his many knives, a routine Patsy witnessed many times. He was engaging in this very practice in the fateful morning morning of March 8th. That day, Lanham had spent the entire night with Patsy smoking marijuana, culminating in Christopher putting on a pair of black pants and a green vest, which constituted the Halloween Joker costume he had bought. After looking online for information on sleeping gas, he asked for Patsy to start writing down what he said on a note. While he dictated this note to her, he spoke about his war preparation and apologized to his daughter, saying he couldn't explain what he was about to do, signaling he already knew he was going to do something of a drastic nature. Though we don't have access to the exact contents of this note, it's pretty clear that it was intended as a goodbye of sorts. Montowski, feeling intimidated and pressured by what Lanham was doing and asking her to do, decided to also write a note of the same kind, despite her not having the same intentions as Christopher. Perhaps sensing she didn't genuinely share his motivation, once Montowski briefly left the room to get cigarettes, when she returned, Lanham refused to let her back in. In order to circumvent this erratic behavior from Chris, she promptly decided to knock on the door of his neighbor, fellow Army Specialist Mitchell Stone. In Building 696, the building these apartments are located in, many of the rooms have a shared a common kitchen and bathroom area, and Christopher and Mitchell's rooms, 258 and 259, happened to be arranged in that way, meaning if Patsy managed to enter Mitchell's room, she could make her way back to Chris's. After letting her through, Stone went back to bed, thinking nothing of what had just happened. A few moments later, he got up once again to get himself some water, only to be met with the couple in Chris's doorway, staring him down menacingly. Without any sort of provocation or preamble to what was about to go down, Lanham simply said, get him to his girlfriend before lunging at Stone himself, trying to attack him with a stun gun. In their scuffle, Christopher managed to electrocute him three times before he was wrestled to the ground by Mitchell, at which point Patsy picked up the stun gun and shocked Stone another four times, all of which failed to stop him from successfully wrestling his way to safety and away from the deranged duo. As soon as he noticed an opportunity, Mitchell tried to escape the room, but as he did it, noticed he was bleeding from his thighs. While it was hard to make out what exactly was happening during the struggle, it turned out that Lanham had been cutting him up with a razor, which makes it even more impressive that he managed to defeat him. But distracted by his own bleeding, Mitchell lingered, which which prompted Christopher to once again walk up behind him and attack him, this time slicing his throat. Thankfully, the wounds he inflicted on Stone weren't very deep, and ultimately, the two failed to prevent Mitchell's escape. He immediately made his way to the first floor and got medical help from the base personnel. Whether they realized at that moment that Mitchell was going to live, or if they thought they'd just murdered a man, either way, it was at this moment that the seriousness of what they had done began to set in. This was no regular fight. This was an attempted, premeditated murder, meaning if they were caught by military police, it would certainly land them a really long time in prison. I have to make a caveat here to say that, despite her active participation in these crimes, it's impossible to know to what degree she was pivotal in motivating these events. Regardless, they proceeded to flee in the girl's 99 Ford Windstar van, which isn't exactly the best getaway vehicle, as you can imagine. They took off, leaving behind a loaded firearm and the stun gun in the room, which was now covered in bloodstains. But they did take with them a loaded shotgun that they intended to use. Right before they fled, however, Lanham thought it was of paramount importance to finish putting on his Joker cosplay, and it was at this moment that he painted his face like the character. Roughly five hours and 200 miles later, the couple had gone northwest of the base and into the Shenandoah National Park. Though we don't know whether they just happened to drive there or if that was their destination and they intended to hide out in the woods. Regardless, while they were still in the car, a park ranger spotted their car going by very quickly and instantly noticed both of the people in it were wearing conspicuous head coverings, with one of them staring at him with wide, startled eyes. Being concerned about how suspicious the whole thing looked, the ranger deemed it necessary to inform the state police, contributing to catching them before they could 
could continue their escape. As police cars approached the van and tried to get them to pull over, a chase ensued. For most of it, they were actually going at a pretty slow speed of 35 to 55 miles per hour, but eventually the police laid down a spike strip, and when Lanham ran over it, he began to speed up in desperation, causing him to completely lose control of the vehicle and crash into a parked pickup truck on Skyline Drive. This blunder culminated in Lanham deciding to do something even more desperate, which was to take aim at himself, but after he failed to position the weapon in order for it to be possible, he asked Patsy to do it for him, which she refused to do. While they went back and forth arguing, police officers approached the vehicle and asked them to come out with their hands up, which Lanham did not cooperate with. He proceeded to point his weapon at the officers and put his finger on the trigger, leading one of the officers to fire at him preemptively. And though Christopher's firearm did go off, it did nothing to stop the hail of bullets the cops had for him, and he died on the spot. It was actually so intense that Patsy was caught with a stray on accident. The troopers and park rangers were put on administrative leave, with pay pending the outcome of internal affairs investigations. But, at least, had no significant injuries despite their encounter with Chris. Patsy's fate, on the other hand, wasn't looking quite as favorable. She was charged with being an accessory after the fact to her late boyfriend's crimes, and during the trial, she failed to convincingly explain why she didn't take the opportunity she had to simply escape the situation. When a federal prosecutor asked her why she stayed with him despite all the insane things he was up to, she said it was because she loved him, which the judge didn't find particularly effective at justifying her deeds. She also described Chris as someone who joked a lot, and that prior to the fight with Stone, she claimed she believed the things he said were nonsense he would eventually get over. Or at least, she hoped he would. She also hoped that she and Christopher would eventually get married and improve their lives. As a high school dropout who worked as a cashier to support her four children, hope was one of the few things Patsy could muster. Unfortunately, hope wasn't enough to prevent her boyfriend from doing monstrous things, nor did it guide her away from becoming his accomplice. Montowski ended up being sentenced to 75 months, or six years in prison. This aspect of the story is very tragic and grim, considering her kids were now going to be without a mom for six years and without a dad forever. Hopefully they're doing well nowadays. While Christopher Lanham had his girlfriend as his partner in crime, she didn't really share his views and enthusiasm, and more so, was just fearfully along for the ride, quite literally. The story is very different when it comes to Jared and Amanda Miller, who took on the role of the real-life Joker in Harley Quinn. While very little is known about Jared Miller's early life, and his now-deleted Facebook account's archives, he says he graduated from Kennewick High School in Washington, Kennewick being the same city he was born in on July 3rd, 1983. However, some sources say that he never graduated at all, and instead dropped dropped out. Almost immediately after he turned 18, Jared began racking up quite a hefty rap sheet. In 2001, just a month after his 18th birthday, he damaged the company's smoke detector and was ordered to pay $50 and serve a day in jail. In the same month, he stole beer from a Safeway supermarket and had to pay $700 and spend 15 days in jail. A few months later, he re-offended by shoplifting, breaking a car's window, and once arrested, damaging a window in his holding cell. For these crimes, he had to pay $950. Regardless, he didn't seem to learn his lesson. As a year later, he'd get fined another 700 for an assault charge, and once again, went to jail for a couple of days. In November, he was charged with making harassing phone calls, which supposedly consisted of him making death threats to a man named Cliff, that we don't have the context to explain why he was doing this. That landed him in jail once again, owing almost $500 for his crimes. Just a month later, a DUI and obstruction of a public officer got him arrested yet again, along with a $1,000 fine. While this was all bad behavior that made his record look terrible, most of these equated to slaps on on the wrist as far as punishment went. They were relatively low-level crimes. It wasn't until July 2003 that things would take a turn for the worse. After being charged with misdemeanor possession of marijuana, a charge to which he pled guilty, he had to serve two and a half months in jail, along with $400 in fines and court costs. Notwithstanding, he was put on probation, ordered to undergo drug treatment, and had his driver's license suspended for half a year. This was the beginning of Jared's downward spiral insofar as his run-ins with the law. Over the course of the next decade, Jared was ordered by courts to pay almost $3,000 for a plethora of different crimes, failed to pay his fines, violated probation three times, and perhaps more notably, was put on probation three times. But more important of all, he made the mistake of getting tangled up with drugs, which is an area that the United States justice system takes very seriously. His multiple possessions of controlled substances, marijuana, and paraphernalia, along with the prior conviction for felony criminal recklessness, culminated in him being convicted of felony drug dealing, all of which landed him in jail for almost two years. Now a felon, he had been pushed over 
over the edge by what he perceived was the federal government excessively punishing him for a victimless crime. It didn't help that Jared had nothing to his name, and his last formal job was at a McDonald's. He began having a radical change in mindset. In 2008, he had voted for Barack Obama, but from 2010 onwards, Miller began making a beeline to radical anti-government beliefs. On his Facebook, he complained about how much he hated dealing with parole officers and doing drug tests, saying things like, Well, another day where these fascist Nazi drug war goons get to play with my pee. Really, get a real job. His parents, who were conservatives and disapproved of his lifestyle, were taken by surprise by their son's new ideology. Though still largely presumed this was just a new way he found to be rebellious and weren't very sympathetic to him. Often reminding him that he was the one that put himself in the position he was in by dealing drugs and getting in trouble all the time. As time went on, Jared's words became increasingly apocalyptic and extreme, with one of his Facebook posts saying, Soon, USA will be slaughtering Christians and constitutionalists by the millions in an effort to bring us one step closer to a new world order. I do not wish this to pass, for this will end this world as we know it. Satan runs our government. Satan runs our policies. The war on terror and the war on drugs is satanic agenda. He explained his previous, more mainstream views as him not yet being awake, and as though he had already suggested acts of violence, nothing came of it. In 2012, at the tail end of his lengthy criminal record, he applied for a marriage license, and in September, married his then-girlfriend, Amanda. Amanda, born Amanda Renee Woodruff, was born in December of 1991 in Lafayette, Indiana, to a married couple who gave her a very respectable upbringing. In her younger years, she was an avid writer of poetry, and during her time at Sunnyside Middle School, one of her poems was actually featured in a national publication. She also played violin at that same middle school's orchestra, and just the fact that her middle school had an orchestra gives you an idea that she had a pretty nice environment. Her talent to the violin was such that she played at a multitude of events in Lafayette, but unfortunately, she could never make a career out of it. And when she became of age, she took up a job position at Hobby Lobby, a retail store. She held this job for a total of six years, eventually becoming a department manager, which is not bad for a girl with no prior experience. At least from an outside perspective, Amanda was a regular, well-to-do person. That is, until she got together with Jared. It's hard to tell how much of the same views she already held before entering her relationship with him, but it's safe to say that he successfully radicalized her. Just two months after their marriage, and just before the 2012 presidential election that ultimately resulted in Obama's second term, Jared had Amanda record him in full Joker costume and makeup doing a mock ad for Joker's presidential campaign. When you vote for the Joker, you will know. You will know exactly what you get. Total and utter tyranny. In between the cringeworthy amateur acting, Jared expressed his views on vaccines, foreign wars, and the Second Amendment, making it painfully clear that he saw the government and his representatives as active threats. While it's been widely, and wrongly, held that he identified with the Joker in regards to being a violent criminal, it's clear that the point of the video was to accuse Obama of being those things. As a matter of fact, the only reason he had the costume and the makeup was that Jared was a street performer, as was his wife, who frequently took on the role of Harley Quinn, as pictures from their Facebook accounts reveal. An employer of his noticed that while he initially favored the role of Batman during his working hours, as time went on and his personal issues intensified, Jared slowly gravitated towards playing the Joker permanently. As for his wife, he said that she was very polite, almost as if she came from another time, which only added to his surprise when he saw how the two turned out in the end. As 2013 began, Jared's tune once again became more extreme and gruesome. On Facebook, he said, Today is day one of the resistance. Today, I declare that I will not acknowledge unconstitutional laws or authority figures. I am invoking the right to resist this law here in Indiana, any attempt to take me away by unlawful warrant will be met with resistance. Enough talk, it's time for action. I was unlawfully imprisoned due to my actions that did not involve a victim. I am the victim of tyranny, and the federal government and the local authorities have violated my rights for the last time. Though the tone is much more ominous this time around, it was still just a glimmer of what Jared had in mind. This post was actually just about him refusing to appear to probation appointments and refusing to submit to drug screenings. And just a month later, he was arrested for it without putting up a fight. After his uneventful submission to the police, his grandmother and father started trying to talk some sense into him on Facebook, telling him to take responsibility for his actions, and that the police had a reason to arrest him due to the threats he'd been making on Facebook. But this was to no avail. A few days later, he posted again, this time making a personal oath to defend the Constitution and his fellow man. He was supposed to spend the summer of 2013 on house arrest, and it's during this time that he posts a few videos on YouTube wherein he's crying, declaring his love for Amanda, and saying how much he misses her. Hey babe, it's your husband. I love you so much. I'm gonna miss your smile and your laugh and the way you can always bring a smile to my face eventually, no matter what, how crabby of a mood I'm in because of the new world order and shit. I just wish we could wake up our families. I wish we could live in a happy-go-lucky world and we didn't have to worry about none of this. We didn't have to go through this shit. I know it feels like it's me and you versus the world and 
kind of is. You know, there's a bunch of zombies out there, a bunch of sheeple. I'm so glad you're not like that, baby. I'm so to the couple's satisfaction, he was released early in July because he had good credit. And perhaps the fact that he was taken to small claims court and evicted from his house had something to do with it. Until the end of the year, the couple worked tirelessly in order to move to Las Vegas with the main goal of campaigning for then-gubernatorial candidate David Vanderbeek. And there's even a video on Amanda's YouTube channel of him. This proved to be somewhat of a blunder because unlike the Millers, David had no interest or tolerance for the more violent and radical rhetoric the couple espoused. Amanda returned to her work at Hobby Lobby, and Jared continued to be a street performer. By February, however, things escalated once again, as on Facebook, he outright said that on a phone call with the Bureau of Motor Vehicles of Indiana that, were a police officer to try and arrest him for non-compliance or driving with a suspended license, he would promptly shoot them. Once again, when it came time for the rubber to meet the road, Jared walked back his statements once the cops actually showed up. A month later, he was back on Facebook, making statements such as, I have compromised enough. Either you stand with freedom, or you stand with tyranny. There is no middle ground. We have deluded ourselves into such a notion. There's no gray area. I stand firm in my convictions and stand prepared to die for them. Those that have been misled, are you prepared for yours? The day of your judgment will come, not from my hand, for you will make me a martyr. Come for me. Free me from your slavery. Give me the death a hero deserves. Help wake the masses to your corruption and treason. I dare you! Jared was clearly looking for trouble with the authorities in any way he could get it, and eventually he found it. In early April, a man named Cliven Bundy was having a standoff with the federal government over a debt of $1 million he was charged with due to his cattle grazing on federally owned land. After almost two decades of battling legally to not pay it, the Bureau of Land Management began capturing, impounding, and removing his cattle from the land, and they also arrested his son, which then caused protesters and other groups to join Bundy's cause. Jared saw this as the golden opportunity to kickstart the Patriot Revolution he always wanted, and Delray said that he expected the ranch war to begin soon, and that it would be the next Waco, in reference to the Waco siege where the FBI and the ATF killed over 80 people who were refusing to comply with their demands. However, once again, the way Jared approached the cause was extremely off-putting to the other people in the Bundy camp. In an interview he gave to Reno television station KNRV, he said the following, I feel sorry for any federal agents that want to come here and try to push around or anything like that. I don't really want violence toward them, but if they're going to come and bring violence to us, well, if that's the language they want to speak, we'll learn it. Ryan Payne, a leader of the militias that were present at the ranch, said that Jared's ideas of being more aggressive and specifically targeting cops didn't jive with the rest of the protesters' ideas, nor was it good for their cause. In addition to this, there was the fact that Jared was a felon, which made the whole thing look significantly worse for associating with him. They were asked to leave, and while the Millers didn't appear to be upset at the time, eventually they made their feelings about it perfectly clear. On his Google Plus account, he revealed that he and Amanda had quit their jobs and sold everything they had to support the Bundy case, and that he didn't understand why it was a problem that he was a felon, since in resisting law enforcement, they were all technically felons as well. On Facebook, he remains quiet for the rest of the month, until the beginning of May, when he makes a very cryptic post saying that he is willing to die for liberty. Later on in the month, his wife also posts threats, saying, to the people in the world, you're lucky I can't take your lives now. But remember one day, one day I will get you, because one day all hell will break loose, and I'll be standing in the middle of it. Perhaps due to the fact they'd already sold everything they had and quit their jobs, at this point, they had simply settled on doing something extreme in the name of liberty, and there was no going back. On June 2nd, he makes another manifesto-style post with ominous wording. We can hope for peace. We must. However, prepare for war. To stop this oppression, I fear, can only be accomplished with bloodshed. No one knew what Jared and Amanda were planning, but it's likely that by the time this was posted, they'd already settled on what they intended to do. Five days later, Jared said, The dawn of a new day. May all of our coming sacrifices be worth it. The following day, during a peaceful Sunday morning, tragedy struck. At 11 a.m., two police officers were getting lunch at a pizza place, and Jared walks in, cases it, then walks back out. When he comes back with Amanda, they head directly towards the officers and mercilessly execute them with firearms they had concealed in their clothes. After draping their victims with a Gazden flag and a swastika, Jared pinned a note on them that said, This is the beginning of the revolution. The couple then makes their way to a nearby Walmart, where Jared fires a shot in the air and demands people leave the establishment, claiming it was a revolution. While this was happening, a man named Joseph Wilcox was waiting in line at Walmart, and unbeknownst to the Millers, had a concealed firearm. He starts going at Jared, unfortunately not realizing Amanda was with him, and because of this, he's caught by surprise by her and gets taken out before he's able to do anything. The two then barricade themselves in the back of the store, where they expected to shoot it out with cops until their demise. Initially, the plan was to take over a courthouse and systemically take the lives of public officials, as Dr documents they left back in their neighbor's apartment revealed. However, at this point, they accepted their fate. When the cops did arrive, they managed to get Jared in the chest, which severely demoralized Amanda. Footage shows Jared on the floor while Amanda tries to mercifully finish him off, though she failed multiple times. Eventually, she gives up and points the gun at herself, closing this already tragic story off in a very dreadful way. 
On December 13th, 1987, couple Robert and Arlene Holmes, a mathematician who worked at a multinational credit card company and a registered nurse, respectively, welcomed a child into this world. His name was James Holmes, and by all account, he was a regular kid. In Oak Hills, the community he was raised in, he was one of roughly 15 other boys in the neighborhood who frequently played all kinds of sports with each other, which James would only miss out on if he had to take care of his little sister, an activity he not only didn't resent, but cherished, as according to her, he was willing to sacrifice playing with other boys to make her company. It's hard to find a kid more normal than him. That is, until he turned 12 and his parents decided to move from Oak Hills to San Diego. A decision he described as uprooting him and his sister to the negligence of his well-being as a developing child. He was so upset about it that, while in the car with his family, James attempted to cut his wrist with cardboard, a signal of his deep disturbance with what his parents were doing. Apparently, according to statements made much later by one of his attorneys, this wasn't the first time James had attempted such a thing, having tried the first time a year prior when middle school began, which supposedly is also when his mental trouble started. Before this moment, the only odd thing that could potentially be chalked up to psychological causes was his childhood fear of what he called nail ghosts, which came out of his bedroom walls at night. Though this can easily be chalked up to a kid having irrational fears and letting their imagination run wild. In San Diego, James became a lot more socially withdrawn and reclusive than he was in his younger years. Regardless, he continued to be a stellar student and engaged in a multiplicity of extracurricular activities, from running cross country to playing trumpet. At this time, it was almost as if he was entirely defined by his academic performance to the detriment of everything else, including his own mental health. Even while participating in these activities, he remained aloof, out of touch for the people around him, leading some to think he had special needs, only to be surprised by his extremely good grades. His teammates found it odd how invested and competent he was in group activities, despite his antisocial reservations. After finishing middle school, he entered Westview High, but very little changed in regards to his general demeanor. Before he graduated in 2006, he did a summer internship at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. During his time there, his supervisor described him as someone whose shyness got in the way of their basic function as over dozens of conversations, he barely said anything unless he was directly asked a yes or no question. As you can imagine, this made working with him very difficult. By the end of the internship, he was supposed to make a presentation to the other interns about the computer programming work they were meant to do. His supervisor notes that it seemed James barely understood the basics of what the project consisted of, and his lack of interest was so concrete that James didn't even reply to an email asking if he was going to finish it. James, on the other hand, was happy that he taught himself how to program in Flash. At the end of the year, he took up work as a lab assistant at the University of California Riverside, a position he held where he simultaneously studied for a bachelor's degree in neuroscience in the same school. Eventually, he stopped being a lab assistant to the Department of Chemistry and began assisting in the Department of Neuroscience, his topic of interests, where he stayed until he graduated. It's also worth noting that, for a window of two months in 2008, James worked as a camp counselor who was supposed to be a positive role model and provide guidance to underprivileged children. I can only imagine how the kids who had James Holmes as their camp counselor must have felt when they saw him on the news. Despite his social shortcomings, James still was a very accomplished student. He was both a Dean's Fellow and a Regent Scholar, meaning he received the most distinguished merits one could get at the university, and he was considered a potential global leader in his area of expertise. He was also a member of two honor societies, Phi Beta Kappa and Golden Key, and graduated at the top 1% of his class with a GPA of 3.9, which is impressive on its own, but even more so when you consider that he picked neuroscience. Again, descriptions of James by his colleagues and contemporaries vary, with some saying he was an oddball, while others seeing him as a natural leader and very emotionally mature which is a pretty strange dichotomy. After receiving his undergrad bachelor's degree, he went on to keep studying to become a PhD neuroscientist, but his studies were put on a brief hiatus when he took up employment at a pill factory in San Diego while he applied for colleges. During his employment there, he was extremely antisocial, choosing to eat lunch alone in his car in the parking lot instead of with his colleagues. True Sigma behavior. Finally, in June of 2011, he was accepted into the University of Colorado in Aurora, receiving almost $30,000 in grants and stipends from two different institutions who saw him as a promising student. He was offered another $22,000 and free tuition from UIUC, but refused it without a stated reason. He promptly moved to Aurora into a one-bedroom apartment in a building populated by other students. He also created a dating profile on Match.com, but it wasn't necessary since in October 2011, after meeting a girl during a study group for biology, they began dating. Unfortunately, it seems their relationship was doomed from the start. Almost as soon as he started studying for his PhD in neuroscience, he also began experiencing shadows, which he called flickers, of people killing each other with all kinds of weapons weapons in the corner of his eyes. He was also increasingly obsessed with crime. Though he tried his best to bottle those feelings up, they inevitably leaked into his normal life. In a conversation he was having with his girlfriend about how neuroscience lab work was stressing him out, she suggested he play video games, to which he replied saying he can't do what he actually wants to do. When pressed on this cryptic remark, he told her that what he wanted to do was kill people, of course. She took this as a joke, but what she didn't know is that James was not joking whatsoever. Besides these odd, quick reveals of the monster lurking beneath the surface, Holmes continued 
continued to exhibit the same behavior patterns he'd always had. Flat jokes that made people uncomfortable, and a distant personality, often seeming like he wasn't there, which got on his girlfriend's nerves. Eventually, after he expressed his interest in making the relationship more serious than she first expected, the two broke up, which according to James, left him intensely depressed to the point where he actually decided to seek help. Very quickly, he was prescribed medication for depression and anxiety, and in his very first appointment with her, he confided his obsessive thoughts of homicidal ideation, and how they were worse than ever. For the first time in pretty much forever, his academic performance wasn't just suffering, but actively plummeting, to the point where Holmes initiated the process of withdrawing from the university, and eventually dropped out altogether. In his interactions with psychiatrists, one of them considered putting him in a hold, but opted against it, thinking that his homicidal musings were just a product of borderline, not to be taken seriously. Though they did inform the campus of his university about his dangerous thoughts, little else was done. In June, James sent one of his psychiatrists a threat over email, but it was still uncertain if it was credible. Eventually, James simply stopped treatment, which his doctors already felt he would do as they sensed he didn't like being treated by them. Little did they know, James had already been assembling an arsenal. He legally purchased three firearms and 6,000 rounds of ammunition, along with a bulletproof vest, two mag holders, a knife, and spike strips, in the case he involved himself in a car chase. He also tried applying to a gun club's membership, but once the owner called him back, he found James's voicemail extremely strange, which prompted him to preemptively deny him membership. Overall, James spent about $8,000 on his plan, though it was barely a real plan, and more so his scatterbrained impulses towards senseless violence. He considered becoming a serial killer, but judged it too risky and not sufficiently rewarding. Then, he began weighing his options for a place he was going to attack, and after opting against an airport due to the high security, he thought of going to the local Century 16 Theater, because it had doors he could lock and consequently increase his casualties. During his tentative preparation for this event, he began writing a diary, wherein he kept notes of the philosophy that drove him to do what he did, such as his belief that, for every person he took, he would gain units of worth, which he called points. However, it hardly qualifies as a philosophy and is much more aptly described as the ravings of a very confused, mentally ill man. So much so that later on, when he was pressed about them, he admitted not even knowing he believed his own ideas with certainty. Specifically, he chose a midnight screening of The Dark Knight Rises for two reasons. It would be full, and there would be no children present. Apparently, even in his extremely deranged state, he had a hang-up about taking the lives of children. Another reason he opted for a theater was that it wouldn't be mistaken for a terrorist attack, because as he puts it, he didn't want the message to be terrorism, he wanted the message to be that there is no message. Due to his fear of accidentally blowing himself up, he steered clear of biological or chemical agents and focused on conventional methods. Come July, the month where it was set to take place, he decided to hire a prostitute, something that he had already done a year prior. However, due to his nerve-wracked state, he wasn't able to do anything and said he just wanted to talk to her. When the lady of the night asked him what he wanted to talk about, he clammed up immediately and eventually just left. As many people have pointed out, no matter how deeply entrenched in his delusions he'd become, he still sensed what he was going to do was wrong, and on some level, he did indeed feel guilt. Fast forward to the 19th, and just hours before his attack, he mailed his notebook to his psychiatrist. Feeling stage fright, he decided to call the crisis hotline to see if they'd be able to talk him down, but the call disconnected after 9 seconds before anyone could answer, and James took it as a sign there was no turning back. He went to the theater during the movie's screening, and snuck out of the exit door in such a way that it would remain open, then returned in with all of his gear. As soon as he set off smoke canisters that he had with him, he opened fire, and ultimately took the lives of 12 people, and injured another 70. When he was done, he allowed the police to arrest him without putting up a fight whatsoever, as he was exclusively interested in watching the aftermath of the shooting play out. He told the cops his apartment was rigged with explosives, and indeed, there were a lot. However, this is when a pernicious rumor was started, that James was telling people he was the Joker, either during the attack or to police officers right after it. This actually never even happened. Same goes for the speculation about James's hair being red and an homage to the Joker, which doesn't even make sense because Joker's hair is green, obviously. A friend of James had painted his hair an odd color a while prior, and he decided he would do it as well, choosing red because he thought it was a powerful, strong color. Additionally, the Batman movie being screened didn't even have Joker in it. It was The Dark Knight Rises, which featured Bane as the villain. So even at face value, this doesn't really make sense. Despite that, the media reported on it relentlessly, saying that he was inspired by the Joker. To this day, many believe he was. During the trial, James mostly looked dazed, almost like he didn't even know what was going on. He was closely watched in solitary confinement due to the notoriety of his case, and of course, there was no bail. He never looked at the judge and barely acknowledged what was happening for most of it. During the course of the next couple of years, his lawyers did their best to make a legitimate insanity plea and pondered having James plead guilty to avoid a death sentence. While he was mentally ill beyond the shadow of a doubt, he was found to be legally sane and could be held accountable for his actions, and in mid-2013, he was found guilty of over 150 charges and sentenced to 12 consecutive life sentences and a whopping 3,318 years, along with a fine of $1 million to the victims of his crimes. To this day, he's
he's incarcerated in Pennsylvania, where he will remain for the rest of his life. I've been Turkey Tom. Thanks for watching, and until next time, leave me alone.